What do you think are some of the daily habits that people should focus on if they're trying to lose this 12 pounds of body fat in three weeks or lose the 15 to 20 pounds of fat over a period of time? What habits should they be focusing on each day? Let's look at both sides of the equation. Let's start with the energy intake side. The most important thing to adhere to a diet is that you avoid or minimize hunger. You'll lose that battle every time. Willpower is not an effective method to lose weight. You're going to have to utilize some strategies to stay satiated. So we focus on that as far as energy intake goes. If you're going to reduce your calories, then you're going to want to make sure you're eating more whole foods and less ultra processed foods. Ultra processed foods will just, you just won't be as, as, as full and you'll want to eat more. We'll want to increase our protein intake it has a high thermic effect of food and it's very satiating. We want to increase our fiber. We'll eat some salads. There's high satiety foods. There's an index that where they measure how long certain foods keep people full. Boiled potatoes and oranges are at the highest of that index, along with high protein and high fiber foods. You want to sleep more because when you sleep less, your body releases more ghrelin, the hunger hormone, and starts stimulating hunger, and you become insulin resistant as a result of sleeping less. Those are all satiety techniques. Drinking more water, particularly during the meal, helps expand the rugae of the stomach, which triggers the signal for satiety. Eating slower. You're, there seems to be a, almost a time clock that starts ticking when you start eating, and the slower you eat, then you'll, you'll, your body will uh, receive a, a, a satiety signal in about 20 minutes or so. So just being more, uh, chewing your food slower, putting your fork down and not shoveling it in. That's a host of different satiety techniques to battle hunger on the energy intake side. A higher protein diet, as mentioned, because of the thermic effect of food. So now let's look at the energy expenditure side. In terms of compliance with your exercise program, just increasing your step counts is probably the most important thing you can do. It increases society. I like to do the 10 minute walks three times a day. I find that if when I assign extended periods of steady state cardio, like 40 minutes on the treadmill, which is very common for a, a dietitian or a, a coach to give their clients 40 minutes on a treadmill. There's so many barriers to entry. If it's not something you're used to doing and not something you enjoy doing, I always say the best exercise is the one you'll do. You got to come home. You got to change. You got to get in the car. You got to drive to the gym. You got to put in 40 minutes of monotonous, boring treadmill. That's the first thing that's going to be abandoned. It's going to go by the wayside when you have anything else on your schedule, kids, job, working late, etc. I try and do the 10 minute walks. They're more sustainable. I can do them after meals, and so you attach a habit to an existing behavior, or you try and create a habit by attaching it to an existing behavior, such as eating. You can do them anywhere at any time. They don't, your schedule doesn't seem to interfere with that. And you can accumulate thousands of steps a day. That's it, better for digestion. It's better for blood sugar control. There's a whole host of reasons why I'm a huge fan of just getting your 10-minute walks in. Wake up in the morning, take a walk. I walk my kids to school in the morning. After you eat lunch, take a walk. And then the dinner or sometime before bed, after dinner, or sometime before bed, take another walk. That to me would be a big thing, just trying to get step count up. And wear a step counter if you want to measure it, because when people diet, they tend to move less because they start to get a little more tired from the calorie deficit. Secondly would be the training stimulus. And again, the best exercise is the one you'll do. And I, I, it should have a resistance component to it if you want to keep your lean mass. Uh, not everybody enjoys doing that. I'm very careful not to assume that everybody loves going to the gym like I do and loves the feeling of lifting weights. Some people think that's quite painful, to be honest. And so I try and design a program that's more comfortable, even if I have to walk the client through or pick the exercises such that they'll enjoy them uh, and get in and do some resistance training. A precautionary note is not to try and do too much because then what happens is uh, people will suffer from what's been terms compensation. If you start going to say a CrossFit workout and do a bunch of battle ropes and burpees, you'll come home and you'll sit more and eat more because you're tired. And so I'm cautious not to uh, encourage people to overtrain. Uh, it's not sustainable and they'll end up uh, eating more and sitting more. And that non-exercise activity burns more calories than the exercise activity. 
the non-exercise activity is just staying on your feet, moving around throughout the day, fidgeting more, blinking more, just the kind of things that burn calories uh, at quote unquote at rest. And if you're crushing yourself for 30 minutes at a 40 minutes at a CrossFit workout, and then you come home and sit on the couch for six hours because you're exhausted and you're too close to the refrigerator. So you start snacking. That's a net negative. And so I don't believe in battle ropes and burpees. I don't assign those to my clients again, unless they enjoy them. I think this should be a very deliberate, very evidence-based resistance training program. And we could go over the steps of that as well. That's Schoenfeld's research. He's pretty well laid out a whole chart of frequency, volume, intensity, load, rest periods, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, all of those things, I try and get my, my clients to train as a bodybuilder would, or maybe even lifting a little heavier weight than they're accustomed to just because it, uh, it can retain lean mass. Let's dive into Schoenfeld's research and talk about what you were touching on towards the beginning where you were like, the people that maintain their muscle, they train hard. And I, I think that people might misunderstand what it means to train hard. Because when you're training hard, there's a certain intensity, a certain feeling, like you're going to, towards near fatigue, there's a certain stimulus. So talk a bit about how he's laid this out in his research. And then if, if somebody is trying to do what we're talking about in losing a good amount of body fat while, main, while retaining muscle, what should that program and intensity look like? First of all, he talks about frequency. We see in the research that training every body part twice a week is better than if you train it once a week. So if you want no to more do, chat, no more chest day on Mondays. That's right. It's not not the one to once every Monday night chest max out day. And for the average individual, I'll have them do an upper body day off, lower body day off, upper body day. And I might do Monday and Friday would be upper body, and then Wednesday and the following Monday would be lower body. So that'd be an eight day split. It would allow people to train the on the same days every week. You train Monday, Wednesday, Friday. This would be my out of the gate prescription for the average individual that wants to go to the gym because it's, and I guess the most important factor, people always ask about the split, if there's some split that's better than the other. And uh, presuming you adhere to these evidence-based guidelines for hypertrophy, the best splits, the one you'll adhere to, it's the one that fits your schedule. If you can only train twice a week, then we design a training program that hits, that checks all the boxes, but is just twice a week. If you can train three times a week, then I'm designing a program like I just mentioned, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And if you can train four times a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, I'll design a program for that. But they should check these boxes. Let's hit them real quick. Frequency, train every body part about twice a week. Volume, do about 10 to 20 sets per body part per week. So at each workout, say if you're doing chest on Monday, you want to do about five sets. That would be a minimum to be effective for stimulus and probably a maximum would be around 10. And it, it's not necessary to, to, to do that, but five would be about what you probably want to start at or, or use for performance. So twice a week, you do five sets of chest. I usually pick two exercises and do three sets of each. That gives me six sets of chest for Monday and six sets on Friday. The effort is where the key component is that you can build muscle to an equivalent degree, lifting a heavy load for five reps, a medium load for 10 to 12 reps, or a light load for 20, 25, maybe even 30 reps. So long as you get to within a rep or two of failure in that whatever rep range that you choose, which whatever load that you choose. So if you do 10 reps and you could have done 20, it's not a sufficient stimulus. Maybe a newbie who just started going to the gym for the first time would start to see some results. But for anybody who's had any minimal amount of exposure to lifting weights, you want to get to within what we call reps in reserve to within about one to three reps of failure. So you probably couldn't do four more. And the more experienced you get, the closer to failure you have to get in order to get a sufficient stimulus. So that would be your load and your effort. They're both covered there. Heavy load for low reps, a lighter load for higher reps, so long as the effort is sufficient you're going to get a similar result. Next probably would be exercise selection. We generally like to use a multi-joint movement because you work more muscle parts until you get more advanced Then maybe you'll use an isolation movement, but it's going to take longer to finish a workout. But 
generally will pick multi-joint movements. The tempo, how fast you move the weights, you just want to bring it down under control. We call the eccentric. Two, three seconds, certainly no more than five is necessary. These 10, 20 second eccentrics don't provide you any better benefit than a two second eccentric. Uh, so you just don't want to move the weight too fast, completely like crash the eccentric down. So control the weight on the way down. Range of motion should be a full range of motion. The more range of motion, the longer the muscle lengths, the better the hypertrophy response. I was a little clip of me appeared recently regarding the fact that I said that you get equivalent results from full range of motion weightlifting as you do from uh, static stretching in terms of flexibility. Static stretching doesn't give you any additional benefit to uh, lifting through a full range of motion for flexibility, while the weightlifting would give you the additional benefit of the hypertrophy training. People got all upset about that, but it is a fact. It's Schoenfeld's research. It's very recent, and it's uh, been replicated many times in, in meta-analyses and systematic reviews. I also went on to mention that it doesn't reduce injury risk and it doesn't help aid in recovery from training. People thought I was attacking stretching, but for the most part, I'm just trying to demonstrate that weightlifting provides a sufficient uh, flexibility stimulus, presuming you, you lift through a full range of motion. The next up would probably be rest periods. And this is important. This is where I think most people go wrong. They get into the gym and they try and lift weights as though it's exercise, and it's not. It's training. There's a difference between the two. Exercise is battle ropes and burpees. You get your heart rate up and you sweat a lot and you, you breathe heavy and you think you got a great workout in and you burned a lot of calories. That's not the purpose of weight training, not what we're describing in trying to maintain or gain lean muscle tissue. Training is measurable and progressible that you should be able to, over time, uh, A, provide a sufficient stimulus for hypertrophy, but B, be able to progress that over time. Add five pounds, add one rep, eventually one more set. It's, you should get, quote unquote, better at it as you continue to do it. Otherwise, the stimulus will no longer be there to provide additional hypertrophy benefits. So the rest periods, people go in and they'll try and just do exercises and only rest 30 seconds or 60 seconds. And we have research now to show that when you compare a one minute rest to a three minute rest, the three minute rest outperforms the one minute rest for hypertrophy, for measurable muscle gains. And so I encourage people to rest longer between sets. And I know it takes a little longer to do the workout. Maybe if your time is a, an issue, then you can superset an upper body and lower body movement, or even antagonistic body parts, chest and back. You can do a chest exercise, rest for a minute, do a back exercise, rest for a minute. And by the time you get around back around to the chest exercise, you've had nearly three minutes rest and you can exert a similar amount or hopefully perform a similar number of repetitions with the same weight. That would be the goal. If you have a significant decline in repetitions, if you between your first set of chest and your second set of chest and your third set of chest, if you have a significant decline, then there may be a reason for that that's not muscular. It might be substrates like creatine phosphate replenishment, acid, the hydrogen ion buildup from lactate and hydrogen ion buildup, dissipation, central, your nervous system recovering from the previous set. All of those things could impact your cardiovascular capacity. All those things could impact your ability to perform the second and third set with an equivalent effort and load as the first set that might not necessarily benefit the, the or provide the stimulus that you want, benefit the result. So I would say that you don't want oxygen debt to be the limiting factor. It's again, you're not doing cardiovascular training, you're doing hypertrophy training. So the rest periods is where a lot of people get bound up, including I work with professional athletes. I work with John Jones and Henry Cejudo, and I currently work with Amir Abdullah, who's the number two ranked featherweight in the UFC. And they all want to move fast through the workouts. They try and they think it's sport specific for training. And it's not, it's a completely different stimulus. And so I have to try and slow them down or trick them into uh, delaying so I can get them to lift. I want them to get stronger. 